I just want to say I can't believe as a photographer who's self-taught and not a photographer with in capital letters with italics as this lovely man is um, that I'm sharing a, a session with him. Um, we we thought that we would um, be very casual and um, and that we'd start by showing um, some work um, and because it would give us something to talk about. So, and we're starting with you because you're the artist. Uh, well, we could go through the work. Of the yeah, but yeah, start. exactly. But basically, we are here to demystify the process of food photography. You know, because basically now what I see a lot on Facebook is that people post a lot of food. Next to pets, the most visible thing on Facebook is food. Cats and cooking. Yeah. And secondly, nobody even goes to eat anything unless they photograph it. So my point here is that I'm going to show you what uh, what I'm trying to do in terms of photography. It's very different from uh, what Naomi does. Her anthropological and, you know, stories about food are very opposite to mine. I came into uh, food photography because I spent a life in journalism and photography which took me to different paths and I was never in control of what I photographed really because there were people and situations and news and for the first time when I started doing food, that was the only thing I could control. Okay, because everything was done according to my brief to a particular place and I didn't have to, you know, bother about anything except what's in front of the camera. So that was my reason for doing food, to get away from Naomi who is just as the author. Yes, well that's that's the artist creating. He's using food to create. And so I'd love to see some of your images. Okay. Don't you think it would be great to see to get an idea of the work? Uh, so basically when I was asked to do my first food book uh, the idea was to I'd seen Indian food and food in India photograph with a lot of props. It was always about other things besides food. You don't think uh, the stylus played a very important part in food photography and as plating becomes uh, and they would almost overdo the food part. So my brief to myself for the first book was that I'll do an entire book without a single plate. I won't shoot food on a plate. And also what was interesting was I wanted to do food like art. So the first book was called The Fine Art of Food and uh, I'm going to start showing you some images. Okay. And essentially I worked with a chef and we just thought whatever we create will be the actual dish that will be presented in the hotel. So most of the food was uh, shot for a restaurant called La Cirque in New York. Uh, La Cirque is a very, very, uh, it's a New York institution in terms of food, an old world institution. So my idea was to make it a little more contemporary and uh, add that graph. It was almost like, you know, trying to do a bit of a hero on a plate. Okay, so I'm going to sh start showing you some of the images and then we'll go back and forth between each other. This uh, is an actual dish. This is a dish called vegetable garden. This is served exactly, exactly like it is, okay, it's on not, the food. Isn't that fabulous? I mean, just imagine that on a plate. Yeah, so you actually get to eat it like it is. Except what I've done is, I have uh, shot it, I have lit the uh, plate, not the plate, uh, by the acrylic sheet from under the surface so that it gains a bit of a luminosity and I could work with the textures of the food. So this is a dish called the vegetable garden. It's a signature salad at La Cirque in New York. I'm going to show you some more. This is another dish, I don't know what it's called, but basically, I. This is how we created uh, all our food. We just, the chef and we just created forms and figures and just put it out there so that it looks interesting for the guy to see. Uh, this is another. So basically minimalism is a very big part of what I do. I like to stay away from clutter and I want to bring as many design elements as I can. That's probably because I was a fashion photographer and my whole basis of design is that all good design is about subtraction. So I wanted to bring that to food. Did you hear that? All good design is about subtraction. Right? It's the spaces in between. It's about leaving things out so that the rest can breathe. It's a really, really important concept to kind of lodge in your heads, whatever you're doing. Sorry to interrupt, but really it's fact. So I'm just going to go through some more pictures. All real dishes, all served like this on a white plate. Yeah, and uh, it's 
funny when I did this show, and you know, and uh, I, the guy who wrote the forward for the book was William Dalrymple, and probably he saw this picture and he told me in the 14th century because he's a historian of South. He saw something exactly like this in a place in Rome, and then he culled out that reference and wrote about it. And it's so strange. Centuries ago, somebody had painted almost an identical uh, version of this photograph. I, I don't have the picture right now, but it's in the book if somebody wants to see it. Uh, you know, we're losing out on the luminosity on this projector, but the pictures are a little warm, brighter, and because they're lit from below, there's always a sense of light, which is not permeating on the screen. Oh, this is a dessert. We, we created this fruit dessert. We call it the Ruby Cube. We created it while we were shooting it, okay? And then now it's served like this is let's serve it. You know, whatever. This is another. Japanese food is very easy to do in minimalism. So it's easy for us to do it. Later on, I tried to do some of that with Indian food. I'll show you. Uh, this was something to do with the generic Italian food and, you know, etc. Uh, this is a cheese plate. These are some desserts. Just plain desserts. So we always felt like using the painterly brush and, you know, fool around with it. Now this is, now this is a puri and alu. So, how do we shoot a puri and alu different so that it makes a little more graphic? Because it is going to be part of the same book. So, I couldn't. So, this is tricky, but I think we managed it. So, there is the alu on the side, the puri in the middle, and a little bit of condiments and stuff like that. Uh, this is some easy to do stuff. These are some lobsters. Okay. So, I will stop now. Now, let me know. I should finish it. All right. Okay, so that, that was a particular kind of a dog figure I did minimalistic graphic work. Uh, but then when you, so that was for a, like a five star hotel, really up market, your plating is very important. Because essentially food today is all about presentation. Yes, it has to taste good, but unless it looks great on a plate, nobody pays ridiculous amounts of money. And these hotels and restaurants actually do charge ridiculous amounts of money. Uh, but this second book that I did was uh, called The Bangla Table. It's for a place called the Bangla in Chettinad. And it is, these are home-grown, homemade recipes of somebody called Minashi Mayaman. And so I wanted the approach to be very different. Uh, like the first book I did without a plate. Now my brief for this book was that I do this book without any lights. Okay, I don't want to use any lights. Natural light. And I shot this book in probably two days. You know, I was there for a weekend and I shot the book and came back. And uh, the thing was, when you're shooting without the lights, it actually helps you because you can actually focus on the critical aspects of the food and leave the rest to be blurred. Whereas if you shoot with flashes and stuff like that, everything gets into gory detail and sharp detail. So that's, I just kept all the stuff next to a window. There is no light. I just use the window light. Window light is great for shooting food because it's directional. So if any of you ever want to shoot food, remember simple rule of life. Just put it next to a light source, which is a window, and you'll always get great pictures because it'll pick up the texture. So this is, uh, and all the props that we uh, shot with were stuff that I gathered from a table uh, in the restaurant in Chetina. There were no stylists, nothing, just me and the person. Okay, this is what the picture was originally, then it was called for the cover. Uh, this is some, um, yeah, so when you're doing stuff like this, you try to pick up some elements of color every now and then. Yeah, but natural. Uh, this is another thing. So you see the blurs are intentional. So I could focus on the central part of the thing and let everything be a little, you know, abstract if you can. Okay, I focus on the central part of the fish and let everything be there, you know. Okay. Uh, These are the rasams. Now the rest of, uh, yeah, so one had it, one needed to add a little bit of drama in the background. So it's more like color, hardly like props. Just But also notice no sorry, notice how the curve of the background echoes the curve in the glasses. I mean this is a very artful shot. It's fabulous. You know, when you're doing this you don't know all of this. No, this is post you just do it, but but when, when that's why I pleased you. Not necessarily, you know, and then but that's what's work one of the things that's really working there. It's lovely. 
Okay, uh, this is another of the dishes on another the pot. These are all things we picked up from a restaurant. They were lying around. There was no stylist. We just picked up what we could and did it. Okay, uh, this is some gajar kahalwa as we call it traditionally. The background is beautiful only because it gets blurred. If you saw too much of it, it would just kill it, you know. Uh, this is again, again, the ingredients of the back are a little bit blurred because it's window light and there's nothing else. This is sambar. <laughs> so, yeah, so I had to, you know, it would be just boring to shoot sambar as it is, so we added some of the elements that are part of sambar. Another something. All homegrown recipes, so I needed a certain kind of look. Now I come to my. Stop. Okay, all right. Uh, now I come to my most recent book. Actually, I haven't done three. I've done about five books. Two are under printing now. And uh, this last book I did was who I think is India's most talented chef. It's a guy called Manish Mehrotra. He, without a question of doubt, what he creates with fusion food is incredible. Uh, he just opened a restaurant in New York, they have one in Delhi, which is like a book much in advance. He's the most sought of the chef for all these Ambani weddings and all of that. Because he does a variation of Indian fusion food which is intense. It's like completely the western idiom, but yet it has a great sense of Indian flavors. So, uh, when I started doing, when I was approached for this book, I said, I will do it only on the condition of I can all the shoot food, all the food on black. Now, shooting food against black is not a very dull thing when it's Indian food because Indian food has never really been shot. Japanese food lends itself to uh, black. But then I said, okay, I've done one book on white, I've done Bangla, so let me do an entire book. So they agreed. And uh, we weren't sure, we'll see how it goes along, but uh, it turned out pretty okay. And uh, this is the cover. I think this must be the only book where we didn't put any food on the cover. I just thought the idea of the black plate and it was embossed and it was quite... Okay, I'll show you some of the work. Okay, so this here, uh, well, the projector is killing the sharpness, but there's incredible detail in all the pictures and the focus is primarily on the food and nothing else should distract from that. Another food. Uh, this is Indian food, all right, so it's like... Huh? I'll have to look at that, I'll forget it, some sort of a chicken salad kind of thing. Yeah, it's tandoori chicken and six uh, And the thing, most of the time when I shot this food, it was not like I asked this guy to make five, six different versions of it and I'll choose that. That's all bullshit. You know, people who tell you that there's some great mystery to food photography are basically bullshitting. I don't put any oil on any of the food. This thing about highlights, there's a whole world photography uh, proposition. If the food is not perfect, I can always fix it in the Photoshop. So I believe technology is there to help you, not to make your life complicated. So if it can make my life easy, I use technology as when I feel like. And uh, so uh, this is some, uh, uh, yeah, I don't remember the what the, some fancy names for all these dishes. Because it's actually served in a 14 course menu in uh, New York. And it, different uh, things come exactly like you see them. Yeah. Alright, so this is Indian food again. These are, well, what we call shami kebabs with something on top of them, fokra, I think. Uh, oh, this, okay. I just play, create this uh, plate on some sand and then we shot. It's looking a little distorted here, but it's quite alright. So, everything is black, so that the focus remains on the food and, and Indian food in a western medium. Because if the restaurant is going to be in New York, I didn't want it to look like conventional Indian food. Indian version of the tacos. This is, uh, you know, it's like the cutting chai and how they serve food on this. So we took some of that and used different elements. Yeah. We played with reflections of an arm. So that's the stuff. This is a dosa <laughs> with some thing. Yeah, how to make a dosa look a little graphic. I think it's part of my advertising background that basically one is design centric, so one tries to do things in the design area. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is a dessert. It's called, it's got some fancy name, some Hindi name, which is like, 
and so it, it, it actually comes in the restaurants like this. So we, the, what you see is smoke is dry ice. We just had some dry ice and you put something on it and it gives you the smoke and you shoot on a long exposure so it looks a little gravy. This, yeah, scallops in a shell. Again, something. Yeah, so this, this, is, uh, this is the latest book. This is the gold gappa, the humble gold gappa, served in different things, yeah. Yeah, with different, different kinds of pani, you know, that they serve it with. Yeah, papa goes with something which is obviously non-vegetarian, <laughs> couldn't know. I shot this book about two years ago, so I don't remember what it's worth now. Yeah. yeah, this is the end, they have this condiment, so we used a small Indian charpoy and did this. There's a papad and some stuff like that. Basically, again, you see, I have a consistent style if you look at it. I try to work within that, you know, things to look. Uh, these are uh, the signature. So we have actual blue cheese because it's naans would look boring. So they get the small naans and huge amounts of British filthy blue cheese. And this is the chef himself. And this is my car. <laughs> we have created a, a bit of an installation for the double spread inside the book. So I put the chef and put all his books together and then I shot myself with the same book. That's it. So I, the books I write are, are about place, I'm, I'm writing for generally a North American audience and I'm trying to make, I'm, and I'm interested in home cooking. So it's the complete other end, it's more like your Chetty book in that sense. Um, uh, and, but that even that's for a restaurant. So it's a, it's, home style but it's a restaurant. So my goal is the other. Uh, uh, instead, instead of art to induce people to feel how special food is in a restaurant and that yes they should be paying a lot of money for this style and special food, I'm saying to people um, try this at home in your kitchen in you know Seattle or Toronto or wherever. Um, it's food from another place. It's from Armenia, um, Georgia, Azerbaijan, but it's actually quite accessible. And so I do that in the context of a book that tells stories about the place and where there's photographs of the place where the food comes from, so you feel an emotional connection to the place, and then it's, there are also food photographs. The thing is, I didn't take the food photographs in the book. I took the food photographs on the road, in the markets and so on. The styled food, the, the pictures of the recipes, the, the pictures that you would have done had you been shooting the book, I don't have, and I don't have them here. So um, when I'm showing you sort of the context around food, it's the other way of trying to seduce people into the food. So you're seducing them by beauty and art, and I'm seducing them by trying to give them a feeling of familiarity with context, don't you think? Yeah, you're authentic. You're no, it's, it's not about authentic or not, though, don't you think? I mean, I think it's, he's saying I'm authentic. No, but I think it's just it's just a different way. We're all trying to communicate something with these photographs, right? We're trying to make something beautiful that pleases us, but we also have a goal, which is I want to, you want to reach people, and I want to reach people, right? Where's your, where's, your, where's your thing? The purpose of any visual really is to entice a viewer. Yes. So she does it in her way, I do it in my yeah. way. You know, I wish I had a well, no. I would I'm doing another book which is about travel, so I've been doing but again I of course because of my advertising background, yes. you know, and because this we are taught technique very early in life, one tends to be a little stylized. Even if I'm shooting a hawker, I'll arrange things, you know. And there is no such thing as a natural photograph, it's the biggest lie in the world. You know, they say, like a famous Oscar Wilde saying, being natural is the most difficult pose I know how to keep. You know, so I want to tell you all, this is all Pisham. I've worked at India today, I've done 200 covers of them in the last 3-4 years. Every cover is a lie. People don't look like that. Narendra Modi doesn't look like that. Priyanka Chopra doesn't look like that. It's all <laughs> carefully choreographed. And, and, and in any case, every photograph is a selection. Even if you're not arranging the hawker stall, uh, to suit an aesthetic, you're still choosing the bit of it that you're going to shoot. So in fact, if you're walking past the hawker stall, you're seeing one thing. If you're looking at his photograph or my photograph of the hawker stall, you're going to have an entirely different impression. You're, you're having the impression, or at least we hope you're having the impression we want you to have. 
All right, so these are just some photographs of the, these are the places in my recent book, and I'll just at some point stop, but I just thought you might be interested to see them. Is that all right? Even though you're here about food. So this is in Georgia in the mountains, in the Caucasus Mountains. Uh, there's a map which you don't need to look at because we're not talking really about it. But that's Iran and the Caucasus Mountains and then Kurdistan. That's, that's where I'm talking about. Um, this is Kurdistan, the mountains along the Iranian border. And this is Georgia again. And these are all just trying to give a sense of the variety of landscape. This is in Azerbaijan. You see, the, you see there's, there's herds of people. It's very dry. It's the foothills in, in Azerbaijan. And Armenia with Mount Ararat of biblical fame in the background. This is the Caspian Sea, an Iranian woman with the Caspian Sea. And that goes with the story about women and being covered and being free and being not free. And there was no one around except me and her sons, and so she could take her shoes off and wait, wait in the sea. And then she, of course, had to get tidied up before we went back into the world. This is in Iran as well, just near the Afghan border in, near Masha. And then there's some history shots, which I can just rush through. And then people, I always find people interesting. Again, of course, the moment I shoot this person, I'm going to put an interpretation on her. This may not be how she conceives of herself. And this is a Zoroastrian woman in Yazd. And this is taking you through some differences of culture and religion. This is an Assyrian woman, like the Syrians in, in a way, and the Syrian woman in, in Iraq and Kurdistan. This is the inside of an Armenian church in uh, Islam. So these are different religions, and then Islam comes latest in the region. And then the um, and the last is the Yazidis. This is the 21-pointed star, the Yazidis. There's a Yazidi woman. So then we get to food finally. Um, so and so in my book, the, my location shots are in there to give a sense of place but also to talk about what the elements are that are important. Again, this is to give people some knowledge so that as they look at the recipes, they start to feel familiar with, with the ingredients. So these are two different kinds of wheat in Armenia, and then you all know what this is, um, but it's in Kurdistan, it's an unleavened flatbread. It's sort of like a rumeli roti kind of thing, very thin, and the next shot, she, see she's stretching it um, to, uh, to put it, cook it on a saj. It's a fine, thin bread. But there's also tandoor breads. And so these are the kinds of shots in the book. Again, I'm not saying to people, oh, in your kitchen in Seattle, you should have a tandoor oven. But I'm saying this is how it's originally made, and there's a way of you making a version of it in your oven at home. And this is what it looks like in Iran or in Kurdistan. And this is another Kurdish bread. Um, this is another picture with bread in Iran. These are bakers, Armenian bakers in Georgia. And here's a Georgian baker in Georgia. And they see another kind of tandoor. Their tandoors are very wide and um, shallow, not, not so deep. And the breads are laid around them, not down them. It's quite different. So the breads have a long curve to them. And more Georgian breads. And then this is an, a, an oven in, has anybody been to Iran? Anybody here been to Iran? This is a, an oven, it's not, again, the problem with the projector, it's not dark. Maybe you're looking at the picture here and you can see. The bread is baked on a slope of pebbles. So inside that narrow slit of oven is a, a vertical, a slope like this, steep slope of gravel. And it's heated on the side with a gas flame. It's hot, hot. So they make a, a very wet dough and they put it on the, on the peel, the long peel, and stretch it onto the gravel. And so it cooks with bumps underneath, right, as you can imagine, and then the top is cooked with convection cooking. It's an extraordinary bread called sangat, because san is stone, right? So um, here's a shot, yeah? yeah. She, she sort of romanticizes the Iranian bread. Oh yeah, he doesn't like Iranian bread. You need to use the right, you need to I'll tell you, I drove, he dislikes it intensely. I'll tell you, I, I drove from Iran to Cape Town and did 26,000 kilometers. And some of the worst food that I ever ate was in Iran. I know we can disagree with that. Uh, can you imagine your naan made three days later, being transported to you on a cycle outside of the street, and then you meant to eat it? That's mo what most Iranian bread looks like, tastes like. And the, uh, maybe it's staple for them, but 
you know, these hard naans are much more tastier and you like them and they are hot. Now, can you imagine having a naan three days later or let's say the same evening? Uh, so, this breads look very exotic but uh, tastes well, like shit. Well, they, they don't actually taste like shit but they are tougher. <laughs> so, it's a different thing. You're using a hard bread but yes, we all have our prejudices. No, no, of course not. No, but it's hilarious because it also shows up the things we, we love different things. We love a tender texture for a naan. If somebody says naan to you, it's going to be tender, you're going to be able to tear it easily. Well, these, no, not at all. You don't tear them easily. They're brittle and you break them. Here's a shot. That's what it looks like. You see, it's very, it's a, it's a hard thing. And so you, you can break it up and put it in a soup um, to soften it, but it's not a tender naan. No, no, no. I'm sure it is very good when it's soft. No, you have to use your, you have to use your, your... No, I'm sure it is very good when it's soft, the oven, but you know. But you don't, you go to the bakery and you buy it, and you carry it home, and by the time it's home, it's not hot. It is always, you're right, it is always stiff. Um, and here's another one that's stiff. This is the breakfast bread, it's called the Barbary bread, and it's also, it, it's got tender, the, the mounds are tender, and the between places are crisp. And so again, it's not at all a non texture, it's an entirely different conception of bread. In the same way, sliced bread is not the same as a naan. Why does anybody eat sliced bread? Well, because sometimes some people want it, but we don't all want it. It's practical. It's practical, right? Um, and this is the inside of the cafe um, in Tabriz in Iran, and I'm actually in the mirror photographing. Um, it's my little self-portrait. Um, and then here's just some shots of food on the street in markets. This is in Azerbaijan. And this is in Kerman in southern Iran. So this just gives, it, these are all just shots to give you an idea and I can sort of stop here, but I just, I want to, it's, it's the natural, uncontrolled, and I think part of it is that I'm not technically trained and I'm not also, um, I think perhaps I'm lazy because the Rohit, what Rohit is doing is taking every single element of a photograph and making a plan and making sure it's right. He's an artist and he's doing a painterly thing. And me, I'm saying, what can I find that pleases my eye to photograph that makes sense to me? So it's an entirely different, right? But there's a discipline in that because, you know, I can't take everything and do something which is not real on a plate. Okay, so it's not like art like art. It's art within the constraint Absolutely. of Absolutely, yeah, yeah. What looks, what tastes good. Okay, the first book, we were lucky we created a look, but it had it, it needed to make sense on a plate and then it served also. But, but you're controlling every element and yeah, that's we, the thing. Yeah, which means you're taking responsibility for every element. Me, I'm not taking responsibility for anything. I'm just making a shot. So um, this gives you an idea. So there's a lot of dolls used and, and, uh, uh, in, in, in the region. Um, Rajma, um, Masur dal, all of them are there and used in layers, in, in dishes. Um, and especially, you know, the Armenians and the Georgians, they have a, in Christian tradition, they have fasting. It's not fasting like Muslim fasting where you don't eat at all. It's fasting no meat or no and no animal product at all, like the Syrians do. Um, so that means they have a whole lot of dishes that are that have no animal product, they're vegan. Well in a climate where they rely on dairy a lot, that's quite a difficult thing. And so they use nuts and, and they use a lot of dals um, in that period to sell instead. Um, it's very interesting, but they don't they cook with oil then and no butter. Um, during those fasting periods, especially before Easter. So this is the oil they use, is sunflower oil. She's selling sunflower seeds in oil. And then, you know, but we can just go on talking while I run the shots, because they're just really images from markets and gives you an idea of a place that's, you know, there's elements in it that will be a little familiar with you, to you, but they're mostly, you know, it's, it's quite another environment from here. So does anybody have any questions? There's not enough of a difference of opinion, not enough of a difference in approach, not enough of a difference in, in dissenting. So, and I, I mean, uh, I teach art, but I'm not into food photography myself, but I'm, I found this. I'm not into food photography, I'm into photography. Yeah, I, no, I'm, I'm just saying about me. Like, I, I'm, I'm not. But I found this to be very engaging, especially because of the differences in the way you're looking at it. 
And I think that's important. That we need to break. We need to have sessions like these rather than. I was wondering before I came because we just met each other yesterday. And I'm not, I'm the guy behind the camera most of the time. This is my first PowerPoint presentation in life. So there are these two gorgeous Amritas in the next room discussing what they're going to talk. We didn't discuss nothing. So listen, we like to keep it candid. And the whole point of this exercise is please shoot food, don't get intimidated. There are no holy rules. Put the food next to a light source, a window. Get the texture and look great on your cell phones, and you know, play with color in the background, and that's it. And keep it simple. And keep it simple. I don't put any oil on the food. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> How come you were in Iran and didn't take any Zoroastrian food? I didn't. I was never in the Zoroastrian household. Oh. And that's just a matter of chance. I was so I didn't have that. That's so and Yes. No, exactly. No, I didn't. Um, I went to the temple in Yant, um, but I didn't. Uh, the architecture of the temples and stuff. It's, it's extremely. Uh, well, that's not my purpose in this show. Right. So, um, yeah, so, yeah, so I, the architecture of the buildings in Yant was very interesting. Um, yes. But I didn't. I, the only Zoroastrian temple I went to was in Yant.